Hey everybody, welcome to the first Broken Bass podcast in a very, very long time. It's been probably close to two years now, which is very <laughs> sad because podcasts are one of the easier things you can ever do because you just sit and talk into a microphone with no real rhyme or reason. Uh, speaking of <laughs> basically basically insulting anybody who's ever made a podcast ever, uh, joining me today is Will Holden. Hello, everybody. And uh, today we are talking about the Resident Evil 2 remake because it is very, very good. It is fantastic. It is. So I've, I've thought a lot about it, and it is one of those remakes that is kind of, I don't, I don't know if it's technically ironic, but it's, it's funny that for the longest time, the Resident Evil 1 remake was sort of like the poster child for a, a fantastic remake. And now, 15 years later, here we are, and Resident Evil 2 is sort of the new poster child for how to do a remake well. Uh, yeah, oh, I would totally agree. Like, RE1's remake was what I held all other remakes to as a standard. Oh, totally. And then I was wondering what they would do with RE2, and they just, they remixed it so much that I, I think it's definitely a new standard. It is such a, it, it's one of those projects where, yes, it's done by a big publisher, yes, it had a, a whole shit ton of money thrown at it, but it also feels like it was done with genuine reverence for the original product. Like, oh, yeah. it wasn't just okay, make Resident Evil 2 third-person shooter and and just go. It Yeah, but keep like so... the same kind of heart from the original and the same kind of, and not, not even atmosphere, but uh, it, it really feels like they went back and studied the original and said, okay, how would it work in a modern control scheme and how could we make it on a modern console? Exactly. That, that same kind of feeling you got back in 1998 when you played it. Yeah, it's it's... Every change that has been made is done with such careful consideration, and even the changes that I'm not a huge fan of, I can still look back and be like, okay, this is why it was done this way. Oh, yeah. Everything felt really deliberate, which, I mean, I think they worked on that for, like, three and a half years or something. Yeah, it's it's been a while since they formally announced it. Yeah, so I, I can imagine that every single thing they, they knew they had to get right, so they really paid a lot of attention to the little details. Oh, totally. So for uh to to before we really deep dive into this, um for basics, uh, Resident Evil 2 is a remake of the original Resident Evil 2, which came out in 1998 on the PlayStation 1. It, for a long time, has been held as one of the pillars of Resident Evil. It's just one of those entries that, uh, out of the original tank control trilogy, or quadrilogy, however many tank control games there were, <laughs> it's sort of the high point. Like, everybody cites Resident Evil 2 as the best of the original Resident Evil games. And I, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who disagrees it, the original game is is so well designed, and that's coming from somebody I am no expert on the original. That's that's your job. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I should I should know things. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. And it's 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 just a fantastic game. It's one of those games I didn't play it until maybe five years ago. Oh, really? And it was yeah, I never played the original. And it's one of those games that still holds up. Like, oh, tank controls, is uh, it's all polygons. Like, it's still a fantastic game. Oh, yeah. And e even graphically, like, you look at those pre-rendered backgrounds, and there's so much detail to a lot of them. Uh, Resident Evil 2 was the first Resident Evil game I ever played. Uh, and I played it on the N64. And it was also the first horror game I ever played. Oh, that's a good and way I to start. I was way too young. <laughs> <laughs> I was, and and that's one of the things is like, uh, I was eleven years old when I played RE2, and this remake made me feel a lot of the things I felt way back then. Yeah, it's um, and I'll get into more detail uh, later on with some of the specific things. Yeah, so uh, fast forward to 2019, uh, Capcom has completely remade the game from the ground up. This isn't like uh, the Resident Evil One HD remaster version two that came out. Two years ago? Uh, I think three now. 
Three. Okay. That's time is fast. Time is too fast. Time is fast. Um, so it's it's a complete reworking. It's much closer to the Resident Evil 4 style of gameplay. It's over the shoulder. It's uh it, it controls like most other third person shooters on the market now. Um, but it is still very much a classic survival horror game, so you're not going to be mowing down wave after wave of enemies. This is still conserve your ammo, run when you can. Uh, it's, it's very faithful to the spirit of the original. Yeah, every encounter feels like a big deal. Like, every zombie could be a serious threat. So, the, uh, for those who haven't seen anything or played the originals, uh, the game follows two characters, Claire Redfield and Leon Kennedy, as they try to figure out why this small Midwestern town is suddenly full of zombies. And the game takes you through a couple different large interconnected areas. Uh, it starts with the police department, you end up in the sewers, and then uh, I don't want to go too far into spoilers, but it goes further beyond than that. Um, <laughs> it goes and, where you would expect a Resident Evil game to go. <laughs> yeah, if if you've ever played a, a Resident Evil game, like, honestly, if you played Resident Evil 5, which is a weird parallel to make, Resident Evil 5 ends with a bunch of really weird references to uh, to Resident Evil 2. Yeah, which is very odd. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really weird, but it's 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 similar. So one thing that I was actually surprised by is the original game is still very much it's not as bad as the original Resident Evil 1 in terms of storytelling. I mean, the original Resident Evil is like uh, you were almost a jibble sandwich. <laughs> like it's it, not it was that bad. Very basic B movie fair. And RE2 yeah. tried to have a little bit more intrigue and some uh, some more human elements to them. And so what's surprising about the storytelling in the remake is that it takes itself as seriously as it does, but also that it works. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I noticed about the remake is that the storytelling is still pretty sparse. That's one of the carryovers from like the classic PS1 version. It's just... A lot of the storytelling is done through the environment or through documents that you can find in the world. There are cutscenes, but they're typically pretty short and not they're not like a substitute for gameplay. Like there a lot of people talk about Metal Gear like the coolest moments are in the cutscenes. Resident Evil saves the boring talky bits for its cutscenes and then you play through the interesting stuff. I felt like it was a good balance. I mean, when you look at the original, if I want to talk parallels, in the original game, Marvin, uh, the police officer you meet, has a has one scene with each character, and that's it. And in this one, I felt like they really expanded his character. He has a real human element to him, but it's not overdone to the point where he's constantly holding your hand or constantly checking in on you. Uh, yeah, they, been... they easily could have made him into the... Uh, the voice in your ear character, like, oh, oh yeah. here's here's this walkie-talkie. Uh, we'll stay in contact. Uh, let me give you these oddly specific mission objectives and a waypoint. Like they could have done that, and yeah, oh, it would have been super easy to make it easier for um, like newer players to give them constant objectives and whatnot. Um, but it also would have destroyed the tension and the fear aspect. And I'm really yeah. glad they didn't go that route. Thank God they didn't do that because. The way the story is told, it's still the original story. Like, there is nothing, if you've played through the original on the PS1, there's nothing here that will, in terms of overall plot, they didn't change anything. It's still... Yeah, nothing serious, and uh, the things they did change are not things that are going to impact other Resident Evil games. And, and we'll dive more into spoilers, because there's some stuff that we can't talk about without spoiling it, but oh, yeah. we'll we'll put a warning up when that time comes. So uh, I, it's it's funny because on a storytelling beat, uh, with again, without getting into uh, uh, spoiler territory, I found it interesting how the game splits up the type of story it tells between its two characters. So I played through Claire for the first run, and I'm in the middle of playing through Leon's second campaign. Mm -hmm. I did the same. I did Claire A, Leon B as well. I was going to say, I think I thought you did the same thing. Um, 
for those who don't know, there's basically two halves to the game's story. Uh, one with each of the playable characters, and when you finish one story, you can go back and play through an abridged version of the same game with the other character and see different things. Which, uh, oddly enough, was in the original, but Capcom straight up lied about it and said that there were no A and B scenarios in this one. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, they straight up said, like, I think they just wanted it to be a surprise, but it was straight up like, no, 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 we did away with it, it was too difficult to program. <laughs> And here it is. So that was that was fun. Yeah, it's it's a fun way to encourage replayability without needing to craft an entire second world. Like they still change stuff. It's not like you're playing through a carbon copy, which again we'll get to in a bit when we're talking about spoilers. But one thing tonally is so uh, when you're playing as Claire, it's very much a story about survival. It is. I need, it's not, I need to figure out what's going on and uh, uncover this conspiracy because it's the right thing to do and we need to bring these people to justice. It is, I found this girl who is all on her own and she needs me to keep her alive. And then switching over to Leon, it is very much a, uh, at this point, the traditional Resident Evil story. It is, uh, I need to uh, bring these people to justice and, and figure out what's going on because that's the right thing to do. And I'm a cop, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but it's just, I, and, and I don't honestly remember how much of the original I played, but I just, I, I found it interesting that they're split up like that, but also very refreshing because I didn't need to hear the same story told twice. Okay, exactly. You get a very different experience from Claire and Leon. And that was one thing that I was I was super happy about. Leon and Claire are different characters. And that's something, again, they could have very easily just made them the same, like, oh, I've got to bring these people to justice. But they're not. They're, they're two distinct, different characters with different goals and motivations. And it's something that really stuck out to me in the remake. And, uh, and that a lot of credit goes to that, that storytelling finesse that, Capcom managed to pull off pretty pretty damn well. Yeah, because that was that was definitely in the original as well, but I, I do agree it was much more pronounced this time around. And especially when you look at other characters in the series, like in RE1, you play as Jill or Chris, and they are two different characters, but you don't have that um, drive with Jill, you know, needing to protect somebody or um, the, the motivations that Claire and Leon have in this game. Yeah, it... They're they're more fleshed out, or they were more fleshed out in the PS1 game, and now they've been fleshed out even further in the remake, which is, again, one of those things that the developers really took advantage of, and they there's that reverence for the original, but they also updated it in a way that feels meaningful. Yeah, they, they weren't afraid to change them a little bit, too. Like, Claire is, I think, 19 years old, and in this game, she feels like she's still a teenager she yeah. feels like a younger person who's been thrown into this situation and now has to take care of an even younger person um i think the the acting is a, a big credit to that uh, same with the uh the motion capture the modern graphics also help convey that a lot the uh the facial expressions were so realistic and lively in this game so honestly when it comes to characterization i do have nitpicks and they're not I can't really complain because looking at this game on its own mostly most if not all of my criticisms are canceled out but as somebody who's been a fan of Resident Evil for a long long time stuff like the shape of Claire's face really mm. threw me off because she's always had a relatively th slender face I don't know if that's the right word but it's it it's strange. She's very uh dimple heavy in the remake. <laughs> I have no idea how well, to say it without sounding like a complete asshole. It's kind of interesting because they changed her face for uh Revelations 2, and this almost looks like I could see this Claire growing up to be like Revelations 2 Claire. Yeah. But she and does it, look different from all the other titles. It it it's a little strange, and in terms of voice acting. Again, it's I I know these characters' voices, especially Leon, who uh, they they changed the voice actor for Resident Evil Four, and that's the Leon that everybody 
knows. Yeah. Like, I, I, I want to say the movies have used a different voice actor. But uh, movies not... in RE6, they had uh, Matthew Mercer, but he was similar yeah. enough to um, Paul Mercier that a lot of people didn't notice. And and again, this is a different Leon. Like, this isn't a strong, confident, you're full of it, Sadler, you little bitch. Um, <laughs> that that that's, iconic That's the line, line verb. <laughs> Your mom's a hoe, El Higate. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, same with um, Claire had um, Allison Court all the way up until Revelations 2, so it's still kind of weird hearing somebody different. Uh, same with Ada's voice actor. Uh, I, I just kind of had to say, like, okay, they're going a very different direction. Um, and it was such a different voice performance that, I, I don't know, I feel like it helped me kind of dissociate the the original with this one. Yeah, and again, my my criticisms are definitely nitpicks. Like once once I adjusted to Leon's voice, I was fine with it. It wasn't an issue anymore. It's just that initial hump. It's like, okay, Leon and and my thing is that I think it would have been interesting to have the maybe not the original voice actors, but um to take the the more modern incarnations of their voice and try to make them sound younger or less experienced rather than just completely recasting them. I don't know if that's something they considered. I don't know what the Japanese VO is like. Well, you know um, how Capcom loves recasting all of their voice actors constantly. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. Like I to go on a quick tangent, I was amazed that the guy playing Nero in Devil May Cry 5 is actually the same guy that voiced him in Devil May Cry 4. Like Oh, is he Oh, I just I guess I assumed it wasn't going to be. I'm I'm 99% sure. I think it's Johnny Young Bosch. Oh, okay. If, I I probably butchered his name, but I think it's uh, again, I could be wrong, but I'm 99% sure it's the same person. He's got a pretty distinct voice. But yeah, so once I adjusted to the new Leon, and for me, Claire's voice wasn't as distinct, but with Leon, like, once I adjusted to it, it was totally fine. Um, one voice that really stood out to me was Ada's, because she was always played by uh, Sally, I think it's Sally Cahill, until RE6, and even when they changed voice actors, it was still played the same, and Ada is portrayed in a pretty different way in this game. Uh, that works with her new voice, but it's definitely it took some getting used to for me. So do we want to do we want to make this the official spoiler section? Because if we're if we're diving into that stuff, uh, we can if you'd like. I have a lot of things to say. We're, we're so twenty minutes say. into the podcast. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, to to go off what you just said, and and again to make it official, uh, full spoilers from here on out. If you haven't played the game yet, go play it. It's definitely worth sixty bucks. It's such a replayable game, and it's one of those games where you unlock more and more as you play, so it it just, it's constantly encouraging you to keep playing. Uh, it's, it's, it honestly felt like a Netflix binge to me. Like, I haven't felt this way in a while, but just one more checkpoint. Just one more typewriter. Like, let me get to the next section and see oh, what- Oh, same. Like, I, I couldn't believe I got through it in one weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's so good. It's, it's worth picking up. Support the developers, you know, it's it's already sold a, a fuck ton of copies. Like, they shipped yeah. three million or something in the first week. And it's it's so good. Just go out, buy it, play it. It's so much fun. And tell them you want Resident Evil 3 while you're at it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, give me that Give me that nemesis in Ooh, HD. Yes. Mm, mm. Tentacle daddy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we don't do podcasts. <laughs> nope. All right, so so we're going full spoilers uh, to go off what you were saying about Ada, so uh, Ada was always played as, like, the suave super spy, and in this game they changed it so that she comes off as, in, in the original, it was very clear she's fucking with Leon right from the start. Oh, yeah. Like, she is not telling him the whole truth, she is clearly not who she says she is, and the idea that her boyfriend is lost somewhere in the city, like, it's ludicrous. you kind of- <laughs> yeah, you you kind of got the idea that okay, this this lady is all bullshit. And it it did a lot back then to reinforce okay, Leon's kind of an idiot, but it, it's it's his first day on the force. So <laughs> you it, it 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 served a point from the story and it also served to characterize Leon more. But in this, 
she's played much more straight faced. Like you would actually believe that she's there as an FBI agent rather than a woman in a red dress just sort of appearing out of nowhere. Yeah. Now, now she's in a, a full length trench coat. She's got like sunglasses on. I can't remember if she's in high heels or not. I think she uh, is. I'm pretty sure. Well, it also changes the the power dynamic because in the original, she just she was undercover as some lady, and Leon felt the need to protect her. And in this one, she's FBI, so Leon kind of listens to her a little bit and uh, kind of stays in line a little more. And it's very different. And and she helps him with the tyrant. She she basically fucking annihilates the thing with a SWAT van. Okay, that scene is so fucking good. It's so good. Just hits him with the SWAT van. It's like nothing dies down here and blows it up. It's like, oh my god, that's what I came here for. <laughs> it's so good. And just Mr. X gets fucking annihilated. It is great. Just for, it's like, yeah, fuck you, Mr. X. I love fuck Mr. X. Fuck you for chasing me through the library for the 80th goddamn time. <laughs> I'm cuddling my Mr. X action figure right now as you say this. I'm I'm sure you are. I am. <laughs> so it's, again, it's it's like you said, it's, they changed the power dynamic. So not only does she save Leon, but she's not officially his superior, but she's that power dynamic is she's definitely the more experienced one. So he kind of follows her lead. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a complete l- reversal from the original game. And I and thought the, the interesting thing is they kept Leon getting shot and Ada taking care of him, which she takes care of him right away this time in the original. She kind of like goes off for a little bit, but they also had Ada get injured and then Leon has to help her. And I felt like that was a really interesting addition to this. And and that's about where I got to in Leon's story uh, in, in the remake. Uh, I think okay. I just finished up Ada's section. Um, and now, like, my objective is, like, go help Ada. But it's not until you take control of Ada. Like, she mentions getting to Annette Bur- uh, Birkin a few times, but it's still very much, like, calm and collected. This is a, an FBI agent going after a target. But once you take control of her and she's no longer, you know, worried about blowing her cover in front of Leon, it almost becomes malicious. Like, this yeah, a is, little bit. Like, Ada Wong and Annette Birkin have a history. Uh, and, and they don't really elaborate on that too much. It's just very much uh, Annette Birkin is Ada's target. Yeah, I love and, the the cat and mouse aspect where Annette gets a couple a couple good traps over her. Uh, whereas in the original, I think uh, Ada just kind of backhands her off a rail, and that's as far as they go. Yeah, and and that sort of segues into the next character that got a lot of uh, updates, like really updates that worked really well. Annette Birkin is definitely more of a character in this than she was in Resident Evil 2. Mm -hmm. So from what I remember in the original, she is very much the, oh my God, what have I done? I love my husband. Whatever will I do? I have to save this or stop or whatever. She's very much the, I'm going to point a gun at everybody and everybody is the one who murdered my husband. (laughs) Yeah. And in this, she's very conflicted. Yeah, she's she's very that's exactly what I wrote down. She's very conflicted because in Claire's story, she wants to uh save her her daughter, Sherry, but she also feels like she's got this obligation to put a stop to essentially what she's created. Yeah. Uh with with G and William Birkin. I feel like there's for a Resident Evil game especially, there's a lot of subtlety where at first she comes across that she's all business, she doesn't care about Sherry, and then the more you see of her, the more it kind of unravels that she's going through hell, and she yeah. she's trying to get her priorities straight, she wants to help her daughter, she doesn't think she can, uh, you know, she she mentions that millions of lives are at stake if she doesn't stop this. And it's funny because... At first, when I was playing the Leon campaign, she comes off as much more of a uh, traditional villain. Like, oh, Ada, I'm going to get you. You don't know what you're doing. But it's if you think about it, it's almost like a way that's how she's venting. Like, she's she's still got that conflict from, like, where's my daughter? I've done all this. I need to put a stop to my husband. So, and on top of that, she's getting pursued by Ada. So, coming across as a villain is kind of like a way for her to take all those frustrations and just put them on a single person. Oh, yeah, totally. And I thought that was 
again, at first I was like, oh, well, in, in the Claire campaign, she was a little more, like, human. She she didn't seem so villainous. And then I thought about it more, and it's like, okay, so she's still got all of the shit from the Claire campaign on her mind, but now she's getting dogged by this this woman who's trying to put a stop to her or kill her, or she might not even know what she wants. And it's just an outlet for her. It's like, yeah, I have bigger things to deal with than you. You're now my enemy. Yeah, she's she's just another spy, another person infiltrating the lab or trying to. Yeah, another person who could have been responsible for the outbreak if circumstances were different. Just oh, yeah. another, another uh, opponent, another obstacle or roadblock. And yeah. it's just it's it's another example of how well the developers added to the characters of the game without changing the story, but they changed the context of it, mm-hmm. which is and they just, also gave a oh sorry no it's just it they did such a good job updating everything and and we're just gonna be heaping praise on this yeah for like the next <laughs> half an hour it's so good because they. They do stuff like this. They they update a character, their their motivations, their characterization, how they look, how they act, but it doesn't change the overall structure of the story, which is amazing. Like to to be able to navigate that level of storytelling complexity in a game that was originally, oh no, the zombies. There's a giant alligator. Oh. <laughs> like to to be able to do that and be so consistently successful with it is mind blowing. Like it's one of those things I can't imagine how hard it was to try and develop a game, a remake of a game that people hold so dearly and try and make these big changes without pissing anybody off. It's and I'm a sure, very fine line they had to walk. I'm sure they piss somebody off like, oh, what? Ada doesn't have enough cleavage. Brr. Oh, people but, People hated the coat. They hated the sunglasses. But oh, she yeah. takes the coat off. Like, oh, people didn't play that far before they started bitching. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a screenshot. My entire opinion about the game has been formed. Fuck you, Capcom. <laughs> I'll rape you. Brr, brr, brr. <laughs> I hate gamers. Let it be known. Yeah, seriously. Um, one last thing about Annette is that they, they gave her a really good scene with Sherry, which I feel was sorely uh, lacking in the original. Which scene was that? Uh, it's near the end where, where she's actually with Sherry and she gives her the uh, the devil vaccine. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember that. It's Yeah, it's it's weird to think that stuff like this wasn't in the original game because... While it can feel a little rushed just because the game, the the story itself isn't very long. I think my first time through was like six hours. Oh, yeah. No, it might have been seven. So like her, her character arc can feel a little rushed at times, but it also feels so essential that like looking back, okay, in the original, Annette Birkin was kind of a cold motherfucker. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really, like, okay, this is a daughter that you d- schlopped out. <laughs> <laughs> I I said that, Ooh. and I realized what I was saying, and I regretted it. Oh, well, I regret it, too. I didn't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's like, this is her daughter, and it's like, she's so cold and uncaring, and it's, in the original, it's a very, um... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very functional characterization. Like, she is there to serve a role in the story, and she doesn't do much other than that. Mm -hmm. But in this, she's a much more three-dimensional character, even if it can seem a little, not forced, but again, it's just, everything happens very quickly. Yeah, it's very convenient, you know, where she is and when she's there, you know, for storytelling purposes. So, and then- Uh, Another character that, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. Were you going to talk about Irons? I was. Yeah. <laughs> I so, absolutely was. So uh, Chief Irons in the original game is a weird character, and he ends up being sort of an antagonist, but he, I, I mean, I honestly, I barely remember anything about him from the original game. And again, I don't remember exactly how much I played, but the the scene with Chief Irons in this game is so good. It's so amazing, and there's so many different layers 
and and uh, ways that they characterized him without just I'm the big bad guy. Well, like, in, in the original, you get a, a file early on that basically says, "Oh, the chief is a rapist," and in this one. You get that vibe, and you get exactly what the game is trying to say, but it never has to say it. Yeah, and it's it's very much, he is a clearly defined villain. Like, when you first see him, he is doing bad things, but it's, the rest of his characterization is is so damn good. I remember going into his office for the first time. And you go up to his computer, and it's got that taxidermy log. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And you go through, and he's got taxidermy animals anywhere, everywhere. But you get to the last entry in this log, and it's like, oh, a four-year-old tiger. Uh, oh, a, a six-year-old panther or whatever. And then it gets to a pig. And at first, I was like, well, I don't see a pig in this office. And then I looked at the age. And it was a 22-year-old pig, which I don't think pigs live that long. Well, it's like a 22-year-old five-foot-four pig. Yeah, and then it was like the description is something like, it's pure white skin is mine, all mine. And I was just like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like that realization. And it's not like the game like drew attention to her. It's like, you should read this file, and then we'll give you a cutscene. It's just like, I put it together myself. Through clues in the environment and the and writing, and when you do, it's it's more horrifying than if a cutscene explained it. Yeah, it's it's so good. It's just like that realization that this room with a typewriter and an item box, a room that you're supposed to feel safe in, suddenly becomes such an unpleasant place to be in. It's it's so good, and it's one of the areas where the the storytelling of the original game is just so leaps and far beyond what they could have done on the PS PS1. Oh yeah. Cuz they have a really good line in the original about taxidermy and like I think they even have like a a sex dungeon or something akin to that because they they couldn't do subtlety um as as well back then. Uh and I'm really glad that they kind of toned it back but still kept all the layers there. Yeah, I mean you had you had eight polygons to work with on the original PlayStation and it's like, well, we can't do subtlety. It's like you said, they just couldn't do it. And the the change of characterization for Irons also plays into uh, how they redid Sherry's section, which Sherry's I, I section was... section in the original game sucked. It was just like a generic, remember. like, you, you run through some zombies or dogs, you do a, a pushing the block puzzle, and you get a key. And in this one... It, they captured a completely different kind of fear than the rest of the game and a vulnerability that you could only get playing as Sherry. Yeah, and it's one thing I really liked is that even the puzzle structure changes. So it's basically uh, you you pick up as playing as Sherry about halfway through Claire's campaign, roughly halfway. About, yeah. And um, in the original, it's it's like you said, it's boring and shitty and nobody likes it. <laughs> uh, and I just admitted that I don't remember it, so it shows how <laughs> strong of an opinion I have. And, and I love that it takes place in the orphanage, which is a brand new area in the remake. And you start reading about experiments being done on children, and just reading about that one is incredibly dark and horrifying. But then knowing that you're reading that as a child character. I mean, it just, it completely changes the way you feel about that. And the the idea of, Umbre- like, Umbrella is obviously evil, but the idea of Umbrella using an orphanage as, like, a meat factory for T-virus and G-virus experiments, it, oh, holy shit, it's so dark and it's so good. It's like you said, they use the context of the character you're playing as to make it even more effective. It's It's so good. And then... They even changed the stru- the structure of the puzzles. Like yeah. uh, the the first half of Sherry's section is like an escape room, kind of. Like you have to find a sequence of items. Uh, I will say that's the only section of the game where the lighting fucked me over because <laughs> uh, I had my my brightness settings. I couldn't see the top half of the puzzle box. Oh no. So I had to like turn the gamma all the way up and then do it and then switch everything back. Minor nitpick. Mm. 
That puzzle fucked me up anyway, because I had uh, dumb boy brain that day, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it took me a while, even after I figured out that there were two layers to it. But yeah, it's like this cool escape room, and then it sort of switches over to more like a traditional, like, okay, this is the spooky part, and then it shifts into like a stealth section? Yeah, a stealth section against Irons, who should be like the putziest character that you just kick in the nuts and run away from but you're you're this little 12 year old girl and he's just ready to get you and it's terrifying and it's it's so good yeah you've got all this context knowing that one okay umbrella is using kids as experiment subjects and two irons is a fucking human taxidermist and then uh then you come you you come across his uh his little workshop yeah, I like fun. that they kept, um, that's the mayor's daughter, which, um, the, is explained in the original, but I like that they kept her in this, and they, they don't need to say anything, just the fact that you see her lying on the table like that, it's just, everything's yeah. applied. And it's just, it's so fucked up, and again, you're playing as a 12-year-old, like, it's, it's one of those things where it's just so unsettling, because kind of your eye level with it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's such a carefully crafted experience, and then... You know, it it wraps up in this, you get to see Irons, he gets his comeuppance, mm. you, it, it progresses the the story of William Birkin, who's completely fucking mutated at this point, and it leaves you on a cliffhanger that you care about because you've spent the last half an hour playing a Sherry in this fucking genius level design, so it's like, you, you switch back to Claire and it's like, fuck yes, now I get to go and hunt... <laughs> Hunt a bitch down, and it's it's just uh, universally the idea of playing as a kid for it's like when you played as Ashley in Resident Evil Four. It's like okay, well, I guess I'll have to do this, and then I can get back to the fun part. Yeah, exactly. And this is like uh, this is the, the complete fact that opposite. She's also written in a way that you care about her, which is something that a lot of horror games can't do well with kids yeah or actually the kid is, which is basically a child the kid is always an annoyance it's like okay well i guess now i have to save myself and you because <laughs> the game told me to and if i don't i'm gonna get a game over <laughs> but and and again i could nitpick like there are a few lines of sherry's towards the end where it's like okay somebody translated this from japanese because <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's a very She's got a couple lines that are like, okay, one, a kid wouldn't say that. Two, a kid who speaks English wouldn't say that. Three, this sounds <laughs> like it was ripped straight out of a shonen anime. But again, very nitpicky, very specific. Like, those lines last for a few seconds, and I was like, that was weird. And then I stopped caring. Uh, maybe she's like a big JoJo fan, okay? She's had a long day. <laughs> Dude, I watched like eight <laughs> episodes of JoJo last night at a friend's <laughs> place. Ah, that show is so fucked up. It's so, uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's so damn good. It is. I need to catch up. And just, I, I, I think back at Sherry's section and it's like, I shouldn't have liked this as much as I did. It is so well designed. And there's even one part I got, uh, shit on because of the game's like scripted stealth section. And I was like, well, whatever. I'm 30 seconds back. It did, it. I know what to do now, and it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's just so universally well designed for something that's completely new. Yeah, well, it's it's long enough where you you get it and you have that experience, but it's not so long where it gets frustrating or tedious. Yeah, and it's I I feel like I'm just repeating myself. It's so well done. It's 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 just really good. It's good. It's go a good play. game. Play the ah! game, please. <laughs> play. Go play. So, uh, speaking of gameplay, if you merge some of those words together and rearrange them. Yeah. So, uh, we mentioned before, we're just, we're done with the story now. We're done. For, My notes say right we're now. done. Okay, listen, I'm gonna probably go back to it later. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to think of if, if there's anything, anything else I had to say about the story. Um... I mean, it, it, like we said before, it keeps the original structure in there. Now, now that we're talking about spoilers, uh, Umbrella is the bad guys. Mm. They're bad. Zombies are bad. Zombies and are bad. Uh, this guy, William, uh, he's bad. He's bad. He's, he's also, a big boy. He's also uh, too many eyes. 
Too many eyes. See you just, from all directions. Just too many. And they're too big. Mm. You're never going to get glasses that fit your giant shoulder eye. Like maybe a big monocle. I want that mod. <laughs> <laughs> the monocle? <laughs> oh, you rapscallion. <laughs> oh, oh, Annette, I do believe I've injected myself with the dream virus. <laughs> 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 Oh, I'm crying. Can, can, can we get a posh mod can for the game please? that just gives everybody a monocle and a mustache, including <laughs> Mr. X and Ada and Sherry? Especially those three. Yes. Oh, my um, God. Okay. Oh, actually, so speaking of Mr. X. Oh, yes. Uh, this this kind of will serve as a, a, a way to segue into gameplay, but uh, Mr. X's role in the story has not changed at all, but he also fits in to a a specific point that kind of again it blurs the line between story and gameplay uh so he's still very much the guy who shows up at the wrong time and chases you you can't kill him you can slow him down for a second you can get an achievement for shooting his hat off his big but, dumb hat yeah I, no i love his hat and you take that back shut up <laughs> you take that back his hat is amazing <laughs> I love that hat. Um, but, I mean, in the original, he would find you in, like, a narrow hallway, so you'd have to, you know, get donkey punched a couple of times or shoot him until he falls down. Um, but in this one, they don't have those limitations. So when Mr. X is after you, he's after you. Yeah, he... Uh, and he doesn't care where you are. <laughs> he does not fucking stop. Which, on one hand, it's it's great because... It, it's that constant sense of tension. You just hear his footsteps. Like, he's not, uh, he's not, like, exploding through doors like a, a character in Dead Space. Like, he's just, he's going to open that door, and he sees you, and he's going to start speed walking. And it's very well done, but on the other hand, if you're like me, and it's like, okay, I need to move these bookcases in the library, Mr. X, <laughs> could you, uh... Uh, could you please just uh, leave me the fuck alone for a second? I just need to. Move. I, I need. <laughs> I need to move. I need. To, I need to. I. Ep, ep, ep. Okay. Fuck you. And then he climbs ladders. He jumps down them. He, yeah. He, it, I love when he just peeks through a door. Like he's just looking. <laughs> Maybe oh, see, he'll I never, see you. I never saw that. Oh yeah. Sometimes he just peeks. It's great. Uh, I. I. One thing I noticed that I really liked is if you run through a door and he's on the other side, he's got a unique animation for it. So, like, he'll grab you and throw you and you, like, do a little roll and, like, come to a stop, but it doesn't do any damage. So, oh, like, that's good. I don't think I knew that. Yeah, it's it's still, like, an oh shit moment and, like, okay, well, Mr. X is here. I gotta fucking book it, but it's not, it doesn't feel like a cheap shot. Like, it's not like, Oh well, I couldn't have seen him coming. Good thing I just took damage, and now I have to use an item. That's good. Uh, that that could have been really frustrating. I didn't realize I didn't do damage. Yeah, I didn't notice because I got hit by it a couple times, and I never shifted from one phase. Like I never went from caution to danger or anything. Um. Also, with Mister X, him suddenly appearing in the main hall is one of the scariest moments I've experienced in a game in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> because that okay, was always so a safe room. Yeah, and it's, my thing is, and this is where he, like, the, the line between gameplay and story gets blurred a little bit, and it extends to the rest of the game, but there's a significant, there are significantly fewer cutscenes that just show off enemies. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, the first encounter with Mr. X in Claire's story he just, there's no cutscene. It doesn't cut away from gameplay, but he just sort of moves that helicopter with one hand. Like a helicopter crashes through the wall of a building. Mr. X shows up and just, like... Just moves it, and that, that tells you everything you need to know about Mr. X and your time with him. Yeah, and it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and you just, you just run, because there's not much else you can do, but it never cuts away from gameplay, and it's so effective. And there are other moments like that. I had the first time I ever encountered a liquor in Claire's campaign. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was able to sneak into the door that it was sitting on top of. It was like sitting on the ceiling and I needed to get into the door that was underneath it. And through the magic of analog controls, I was able to like inch my way down the hallway and get into the room underneath it. 
And again, it never cut away from gameplay. It's not like, here's a liquor. Which was like, great on the PS1. It was a great little FMV, but it's it's just not needed anymore, especially with this new camera. Yeah, and that it's not necessary. Like, they could have totally done the thing where, like, the camera just sort of moves in, and it's like, oh, it's a liquor, and then it, like, pulls back, and you're back in, like, the third-person view. But the fact that they never take control away, it's just like, it's you don't get that that respite that comes with a cutscene. Like, mm-hmm. okay, I can take a break because I'm not in control. It's like, oh shit, what do I do? What what do I do? What do I do? It's like, oh, it's it's there. It's just already there. <laughs> you have to react to it immediately, and that also punishes players who just charge in. And oh, maybe it's too late now. <laughs> yeah, like it's already heard you. And so I was able to sneak into that room and get a, a couple items, and I was like, okay. I'm going to go back out there. It's my first liquor. It can't be that hard. I'm going to fight it. Load up my grenade launcher and I walk out and it's gone. Mm. It had just, it vanished. There was no sound, no nothing until I walked down the hallway and I could see like the, the very shadow of the tip of its claw sticking out from around the corner and the motherfucker had moved down from the ceiling onto the wall and had hidden around the corner and waited for me. And I was like, that is such good fucking design. And it was so scary. And I was sitting there just praying to God that it didn't notice me. And then it noticed me and I lit it on fire and I ran away and I cried a lot. And it was so good. (laughs) So good. There, There are a few moments like that, especially with liquors where they'll move depending on what door you come in Or if you go through a hallway with a barricade, they can climb over that and they'll be in the next hallway. The game does a lot of interesting things with as few liquors as there are, keeping them scary and keeping them, um, I I don't know, unique experiences, I would say. They're a threat. And yeah, Yeah. they're... they're, It's it's far removed from just a hunter running down you at a hallway. Yeah. Like... Because cause hunters were scary in the first Resident Evil game because they were tanks. They were big, they were fast, and they did a lot of damage, and they had a lot of health. But in this game, liquors don't have a ton of health, but... It, yeah, it's not unreasonable. They're, they're used so effectively, and they're so far removed from zombies. It's such a good way to keep the gameplay interesting. And then, you know, balancing zombies and liquors and Mr. X following you, because you have to be quiet but you can't just sneak around liquors when you have so many other things stomping at you from different directions and even even the regular zombies like i remember early on in claire's run i went into like one of the offices and i shot a a zombie and he went down and i did some more rummaging and i left the room and i was like two rooms down and that same zombie i could tell from like the wounds in the head and like he was missing his eye and everything he had followed me like three rooms down because I wasn't moving quickly enough to break his line of vision. Yeah, they they are so persistent now. I was like, you motherfucker. And then I shot him and he died. But <laughs> like the, just that moment of realization, like this motherfucker has been hunting me down. And it's so like, it's not a boo jump scare, but it's still like really unsettling. Just like these things will just follow you and they will track you down and they will try to kill you. Like, I was really worried that that uh, standard zombies wouldn't be a threat. But, again, the developers did a real good job of just <laughs> yeah. designing them so that, yeah, they're still slow-moving zombies and you can avoid them and they're not necessarily hard to fight, but the resources required to take them down and the fact that you usually have another threat to worry about and it it it's... It's all just so well balanced. Yeah, it's, it's always fight or flight, which is exactly what survival horror should be. Yeah, and I was worried that the shift from, you know, the the top down sort of security camera angle to a third person view would maybe not be a detriment, but it 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 changes things. And I wasn't sure if they were going to be able to handle that for the the better. Mm-hmm. But guess what? They did. Yeah, oh, shocker! Yeah, totally. Absolutely, shocker! I have positive opinions about the changes they made. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so like the <laughs> the overall pacing is still really well done. It well, is the pacing is I th- I thought it was exceptional on the remake. It's 
it's fantastic. Like it's it is that sense of constantly unlocking stuff or getting rewarded for doing the optional things like uh going to the to the weapons locker and putting the key the keypad back together and getting like a bunch of extra items and a storage upgrade like you don't have to do that you can just leave that stuff in your item box the entire time and but there's the game so much backtracking but it always feels reward it never feels super tedious yeah exactly. even when you're in the sewer and you find a way back to the police station it's not like Oh, now I guess I can do all this stuff. It's, oh, wow, okay, I can go back and get the stuff I missed. And you want to clear out rooms and explore everything. And I I wasn't as huge a fan of the sewers. I didn't like the poison monsters. Mm -hmm. I I thought there was, there's one room in Claire's campaign where you've got to fight like four of them. And it's like, okay, or not. (laughs) I don't have to do this. I used all my blue herbs. Um, luckily, they give you the uh, the spark shot at least, so it's like okay, you can. Here's your gun for this section. <laughs> yeah, but I just it it felt that was the one point of the game where I was like, that's a little much. Yeah, I, I would agree. The sewers were definitely my least favorite. I I like them as an improvement over the original, where there wasn't much to it. Uh, but nobody wants to explore sewers. Didn't the original have giant spiders? Yeah, they replaced them with the uh, the G babies in this one. I don't miss the spiders. Um, I was kind of hoping to see them. I'm I'm I hate spiders, but I I, I don't know. I miss them. They were furry. Yeah, I don't I, I don't miss spiders. So yeah, and then I I really loved the um the facility, the umbrella facility at the end. It felt like a um. So, like, the, the RPD is, like, this big, interconnected, kind of Dark Souls-y level design. A little bit. Where, where you're unlocking shortcuts and, and backtracking and figuring out the most efficient route. But then you go to the sewers and it's a bit more linear, I guess. Like, there's there's a, a, a more fixed order of, like, what you do and which, which order. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the facility... The facility is like three mini RPDs like stacked up next to each other. And that I for for pacing purposes, I thought that was a great way to return to the level design that they established, but also up the stakes by giving you the sensation, okay, now I'm clearing out these areas faster than I was. You know, the the pace of it is is amped up without necessarily changing the gameplay or the tension around, which is and and leveling up your your security pass was also a great way of showing progression. Yeah, that so uh you get a wristband that like lets you into specific doors and the the section each the goal of each section of the facility is basically upgrade your security clearance to ultimately get to the cure for Sherry's infection. Which uh the labs in this one are entirely different from the original, save for maybe a couple of rooms and a couple of ideas. Yeah, it's, I mean they have probably, I'm sorry. They 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 left the big um central room in. Yes. And that was the only point I recognized. Um and it's the most creative liberty they've taken in the remake, but I think it, it really benefits the the structure, the level design. Uh, it really makes it feel more like an organic facility and not just yeah. here's a series of rooms that are supposed to be a lab. Like, I can see people working here, even if it does have that crazy pillar in the middle. <laughs> yeah, that was like, and I, I totally understand why they, they carried over the massive hub room. It's like, it's like the, the main hall in the RPD. Like, it's an iconic location in, yeah. in this game. But the fact that they added, like, the living quarters and the nap room and uh, the cafeteria and the, the nap room is actually another one of those examples of like looking through the documents and getting something out of it. Like the fact that they have the logs of the scientists who are resting. And then there's one guy at the very end of the list who never left. Like he never signed out. And I was like, motherfuckers, a zombie. Yeah. I, and I, of I'm course gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to get you. Going to get you. The computer voice, too, was a pretty cute addition. Sometimes it almost felt like GLaDOS a little bit. Like when it says you're going to be um, reprimanded for uh, spreading the toxin over the plants and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And then if you go back to that computer, the last email is the automated uh, like suspension notice. 
Yeah. Like, you get written up by the computer, and you can go and find that notice, that letter, after you do everything. Like, that attention to detail is fantastic. (sighs) It's real good. It's real good. It's it's a real good Ah, game. It's it's so good. Also, I need to to talk about this. I said, if those motherfuckers put a reference to the movie in, I was gonna shit. And you know what? They called the lab the nest. And you know they were thinking about the hive from the movies. I got you, Capcom. I fucking see what you did. <laughs> oh, those movies are terrible. They are absolute spot. <laughs> I watched, so back when they came out, that was what, like high school, like oh, early yeah. high school. Totally. And I, I remember liking Resident Evil Apocalypse because the nemesis showed up and it was done practically. I went back like last week and watched those scenes. I was a stupid, stupid child. Yeah, I know. Same here. Same here. <laughs> I saw that shit in theaters and I was like, oh, Nemi. And now it's like, oh boy. <laughs> N- Nemesis Senpai <laughs> Nemi Chan <laughs> Nemi Chan if, Oh Nemi if, Chan If there isn't a Nemi Chan Like schoolgirl outfit Alternate costume in RE3 remake I'm not buying it Yeah no we'll we'll have so, to I'll just send this directly to my uh, My PR contact at Capcom And yeah. he'll be confused and then uh, Take me out of his contacts list I'll send this to uh, to Kat The community manager Okay yeah that'll that'll work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should talk uh, about. Oh, um, there's, there's so much. Oh my god. The the fact that you get a fucking minigun at the end, like yeah. Just, mm, uh, mm, oh, oh yes. And it's like I walked into that room and I saw the minigun and I knew what was coming. It's like okay, final fight with G. Like, let's do this, I'll kick you in the dick. And then you just turn the corner and there's just a, a full-ass fucking Vulcan Raven minigun sitting there. And I was just <laughs> <Why> like, <not? laughs> yes, please. And it's like, it's the Gatlin gun from uh, the original that you unlock. And that's kind of cool. Oh, I didn't know that. But that's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing that's what it's a reference to. So, like, now each character gets a specific weapon for their final fight. And I think that's a really nice addition. Yeah, because I haven't, I haven't beaten... Uh, the Leon campaign yet, so I'm still like, I'm curious to see what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna say too much. <laughs> I I appreciate it. Uh, I will say vaguely, um, for Leon's ending, I like how much it differs from Claire. I like that they didn't make it dependent on A and B scenarios. Uh, and yes. his final fight is pretty cool. So that's all I'll say about that. And uh, what was it? I just had it. Um. Oh, so I mentioned it before. The attention to detail in this game is fucking crazy. Uh, if you look closely on in the gas station that Claire runs into at the very beginning, there is an ice cream cooler next to the door, and it says, Herbs Heal You, Raccoon City Herbal Ice Cream. And I was just like, <laughs> that's so good. And there's so many little moments. I didn't notice that. Yeah, if you look on it, it says it says something like herbs herbs heal you, raccoon city herbal ice cream. That's amazing. And there's I, I might be remembering it wrong. It's it's like a blink and you miss it thing at the very beginning of the game. But I think it's got like different flavors on it and they're different colors. Uh if you want to talk attention to detail, the character models get like scuffed up throughout the game. Oh, and yeah. if you get bitten, that bite mark will stay. Yeah. Or, like, if Birkin's, like, disgusting eye juice gets on you, that, you can still see it a couple hours later. And like, I want to, I'd like to test it, and this only applies to, like, the first uh, third half of the game, but I'd like to see if that stuff washes off when you go outside the police station. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Because I'm, I'm not sure if it does. I know that, like, their faces get scuffed up, and, like, Leon loses a sleeve, and then you can see his bicep. And it's, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it'd be interesting to see if, like, the blooded stuff washes off. Yeah, I don't know. That, that would be interesting to check. Because I was, I can't remember which game I was just playing where the blood does wash off. Oh, Red Dead. Like, if you get shot in Red Dead, it's very similar, but you can, like, go into a lake, and you'll see it come off your clothes. 
Oh, wow. So I'd be interested to see if they did something similar for this, because I could totally see them doing it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Stuff like if you shoot off Mr. X's hat, it stays off. Like, he doesn't <laughs> care about it, so he doesn't go back for it, which, um, I, I mean... I shut it off immediately so I didn't see this, but I heard somebody say online that if he punches you and he's wearing the hat, he fixes his hat after. I don't know if that's true. I, I saw some... want. I want to say that happened, but I don't, I honestly don't remember. Mm. Um, because whenever he punched me, I was very scared and not <laughs> paying attention to his fashion. <laughs> oh, the way that Mr. X gets it in Claire's campaign is so good. It's so brutal. He, I couldn't believe he it. He gets like gutted by William Birkin as like this fucking G monster. And it's so good. And you see like, and it, again, attention to detail, it's all, like, his guts spilling out and, like, oh, it's all goopy and blah. Yeah, he looks like a jigsaw piece. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, just part of That's the gone. biggest jiggy I've ever seen. <laughs> and um, uh, there was one other that I'm trying to think of. The, uh, when you first get to the main hall and you download, like, the map from the computer, the computer map on screen looks the same as it does in your inventory. Mm -hmm. Like they, they both share that and they're both callbacks to the original game, having like six pixels to make a map with. Yeah. And then, um, Oh, so one that I, I just noticed when I was playing last night. So there's the section we talked about it before where Leon gets hurt and then Ada goes off to find, uh, Annette, And then eventually you switch back to, uh, Leon when Annette burns that body, once you get back to Leon, you can see the G parasite trying to crawl out of him, and it's all, like, charred and frozen, and it wasn't there before. Oh, I don't know if I noticed that, even. Yeah, so, like, it starts off looking like a normal corpse, but once you get back into Leon, like, once you start playing as Leon again, you can see the G parasite sticking out of it. It's all, like, charred up and frozen and... They didn't have to do that. Like, a lot of people wouldn't notice that. A mm. lot of people wouldn't care, but, like, I just happened to notice it, and it was one of those things, like, oh, my God, that's fucking great. And I I don't remember the last time I was this gung-ho about, like, attention to detail since, like, Wolfenstein The New Order. Like, that was another game where it was just, like, details everywhere, and it was so good. And that's a definite, like, reason to replay it once you know where you're going and what's going on, just looking at everything around you. Just, like, I love that one of the solutions to the puzzles, uh, one of the early puzzles is Leon has to unlock his desk. It's like a friendly, like, it's rookie so first day prank. But then, you know, it's an office that's been ravaged by zombies, and you have to find the initials of the first name of all your desk mates. And one of the desk uh, nameplates has gotten knocked off, and you have to go search for it. It's little stuff like that is so good, and it's... They never would have been able to do that on PlayStation. Like, you wouldn't have even been able to see it. The The end of that note is like, be glad you're not here, rookie. And it's like, that just, it's so sad. And again, it adds another human element to all the, the characters. And it's it's that same, like, horror that's like, what was it in RE1? Like, itchy, scratchy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, the itchy, scratchy cartoons. Yeah. In the Simpsons. No, uh, for itchy, tasty. That one. That that like when the first time you read that note, it's like it it sends like shivers down your spine. It's like oh oh no, and then he like bursts out of a closet, and it's like oh no yeah. <laughs> and so we've we've spent the past hour talking about how good this game is. Is there anything that stuck out to you as frustrating, or you didn't like the addition, or you uh. wish that something had been done differently? So like for example. And again, all of my complaints are super nitpicky. I get that. I liked in the original, you could walk up and hit interact on like the environment and it would give you like a little flavor text. Yeah, I agree. And there were parts of this game that I really wish had that. For instance, like the taxidermy room in, uh, in Irons' office or the main hall. Like it would have been cool to have those little like moments of world building and interaction and in some cases in the original, they were like a little bit of characterization. Like you would get like a little bit of a quip from uh, Claire or Leon. And I feel like that's kind of been replaced with the contextual dialogue, which I did not like. 
Yeah, no, I, there was too much of that, I feel. Yeah, I wish you could turn down, like, the frequency of which that happened, because hearing Claire go, you bastard, as I shoot a zombie in the face for, like, the fourth time, it's like, okay, I get it. Or, like, when like, you're at I the don't... end of the game and she goes, what's with you? It's like, bitch, you know. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> he's got six arms at this point, like, yeah. and it's it's not bad, and it happens with both, well, it is bad. Um, <laughs> I'll take a stance. Yeah, no, it's not And great. it happens with, with both characters, and, like, once in a while, it would be okay, and honestly, I wouldn't mind if it was just, like, a gasp. Like, <gasps> or, oh, oh, or, oh, 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 Jesus! Like, <laughs> <laughs> just Leon sees Mr. X, holy mother of God! No, that would be appropriate. Yeah, it's, but, it, it's, because it's all random and contextual, Claire will go from, like, oh my God, to, uh, these guys just need to die already. Whoa. And it's like, it's distracting and it never fails to like pull me out of the experience. It's the one addition that I don't think works. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, that's probably my biggest nitpick is just, I wish I could turn that down or off. Yeah. I actually looked in the settings to see if you could turn it off. I don't, I feel like that would be a huge pain in the ass to program, but that's yeah. really the one the one addition that I didn't like. And then there's like there's nitpicky stuff in terms of like game balance. Like I made a joke about it before like okay, Mr. X, can you please leave? But that is kind of an issue. In most of the mm -hmm. puzzles you get like transported to the little pocket dimension so you can do the puzzle without Mr. X fucking you over. But there are sections where it's like okay, can you please just leave? I need to get to this one area, it's the last thing I can do before moving on. I just need you to go, or I can't make any progress. Like, you get to the third floor of the police station by rearranging the bookshelves in the library, and I had Mr. X up my ass, and I could not make any progress until I did, like, a lap around the station to get him off my back. And stuff like that is, it's a consequence of having a new system where he just follows you relentlessly. I don't know if there's any way to fix that other than keeping him out of the library, which doesn't feel right. Like just saying, okay, the player will eventually be able to move this stuff. Mr. X can't go in the library. Like that doesn't make any sense either. So yeah, that that's something where it's tough to balance. And it's, it's one of those things like I'm sure a lot of people didn't have that issue. It's just that's what happened to happen to me. That's just where I happened to be and all the, the factors came together and like, it's not something I can really fault the game for, yeah, but it no, was obnoxious. And that happened that happened a couple times, maybe twice. It wasn't like an issue that ruined the game for me. And then there are a couple times where it's just like in a similar vein, just the shit falls on you. Like I had a hallway full of I was running from Mr. X. There were like three zombies and a liquor in the same hallway. And I just got jumped. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I just got pinballed. Yeah. I think in, in the, the sequence where you all the jail cells open in Leon's campaign, I literally got punched by Mr. X into a zombie that brought me into danger mode. Oh, my like, God. It, it was just like so frustrating. And there are some points where Mr. X has a pretty wide reach. So he can just like swing at you and he'll just stun lock you if you're in the wrong spot. And, and that sort of thing can be frustrating, especially when. Yeah. Oh, zombies can totally stun lock you too and just keep oh, going yeah. and going. And it's that was enough to make me stop playing for the night once. Like I was just like, OK, whatever. Like I don't need to play anymore tonight. I didn't lose a ton of progress. Like I, I you know, you wake up at the typewriter. Mm -hmm. But it was just it was just frustrating enough to make me put the controller down because it was like I couldn't do anything. That wasn't my fault. I I couldn't yeah, uh, yeah, have done anything different. I just get. And with Mr. X, like it's fun to be chased. It can be tough, but it also feels like personally, it never felt like I had the resources to uh, slow him down and it would have been worth it. And I feel yeah, like because I mean, I, I think it only takes a few grenade rounds to uh to slow him down but he's only down for like 20 seconds yeah it's not it's so in um resident evil 3 the fights against nemesis weren't always scripted but 
you could get in like the main nemesis fights, if I remember right, you could get special weapon parts for fighting him. So there was a reason. Yeah, I think you could with Mr. X too in uh, RE2 if you brought him down. Yeah, and so it, being forced to run away from him does reinforce sort of the horror themes, but it's also they could have given a reason. Like they gave him all these systems like knock his hat off, stun him, but there's no real reason to do that because you can just outrun him. Yeah. So it it, it never feels it would have been cool if there was like a proper boss fight against him. I feel like that's the only real missed opportunity. Like they could have had a fight against Mr. X in like the parking garage or something. And mm. then and then he still gets eviscerated by by Birkin or he gets hit by Ada, but I feel like that could have been a fun fight and they never cuz there's totally a, a point where you just want to kick Mr. X in the dick. And be well, like, don't you worry about a thing, Stephen, because someday, maybe. In the original, you could. Well, yeah, but this isn't the original, so. Well, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, okay. <laughs> and then, but I mean, seriously, Capcom, if you remake Resident Evil 3, I will pre-order that shit today. Oh, there, there's a rumor that they're already working on it, and I would be shocked if that was not true. Well, the thing is, they could reuse a lot of the environments yeah. from, fr- and, and, and like, Honestly, if they put it out in a year and they just use the same graphics and the same assets and shit, oh, they will, I would absolutely. not care. I, I would either. not care. Like, holy like, shit. You go to the police station, they could just straight out rip rip that from this game, rip like the cars and assets from the street and stuff, put that in RE3, and it would be fine. It would be completely fine. And I mean, there were a couple moments where like the bolt cutters... In Resident Evil 2, those are just the bolt cutters from Resident Evil 7. Like, yeah. I don't I don't oh, know yeah, if they even changed the model. Like the um the tape you have to cut, that box is the same. Um, that animation might be the same. Yeah. The uh the big white boxes you see around are straight out of seven. The box where you get the um police car key is just the same one you get the lock picks from in RE7, but they've made it yellow. Yeah, so it's like if if they took all those those assets and just repurposed them into an equally well made remake of Resident Evil Three, oh my god, holy shit! Because Nemesis is my favorite character in the series or monster. I don't know if he's really a character. It's totally. But that's it's it's hard to pick between Resident Evil Two and Three because there's parts of Three that aren't great. Does anybody really like but those could be so so just changed up and remixed for a remake? Yeah, like who remembers Carlos? I like Carlos. Yeah, but his section kind of blows. Uh, his section, uh, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's not it's not as good as the rest of the game. It's like it was the sherry of his game. Yeah. Well, what I love is um the original had those live choices where you had to pick one option or the other, and yeah. that could just be straight up gameplay in this. Yeah, like, it you doesn't as the have player to be, just make a decision. It doesn't have to be so telegraphed. Yeah. And uh, it's just, if they end up remaking it like that, I would be so fucking excited. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. I, I would buy that in a heartbeat. I like that we tried doing a section of stuff that we weren't happy with, and we ended up getting back to the stuff that we were <laughs> I know, because we, we agreed on the same, like, oh, yeah, that wasn't great. Yeah, that wasn't great either. Okay, well, how about? <laughs> yeah, it's it's just such... It's such a, a well-made, such a thoughtfully made remake. I attributed it to a Netflix binge before, and that's honestly, there have been times where I was like, okay, it's one thirty in the morning, I should probably put this down and come back to it tomorrow. But man, I really want to get to that next typewriter and open that door that's been pissing me off for 30 minutes. Like yeah. the the nitpicks that we have, stuff like the game balance and Mr. X being a giant dildo in the face <laughs> of my fun. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a metaphor? Those moments, those nitpicks, those complaints are so minor and they're so minimal and they have such little impact on the overall experience of the game it's just if you like survival horror if you like resident evil if you like the new resident evil if you like the old resident evil you should just play this fucking game it is so well made and well crafted and it was obvious that yeah they they put this product out and it's going to make a bunch of money and there were business decisions and whatever 
it's still very clear that the people working on this game cared about not just the game that they were making, but the game that they were remaking as well. And that's mm. that sort of project that comes together so well is so rare in this industry of, you know, people complain about like Destiny uh, games as hobbies or chores or whatever. And those are valid complaints. So to get something like this, a strictly single player game built on a single player campaign that's designed to be replayed and it's a remake of a PS1 game from a billion years ago. The, the the fact that this game came out at all is amazing. And the fact that it's so damn good that we can sit here for almost an hour and a half and just heap praise upon it is fucking mind blowing. So go out and play the game before I come to your house and break your legs. Yeah, before we burst in like Mr. X. Yeah, that's okay. Because this is this is such a good balance. Uh, because you could tell for a long time Capcom wasn't sure how to please old school fans, RE4 fans, and then they tried like RE5 and 6 and Revelations. We still got to play through RE5. Yeah, uh, do we? <laughs> um, and this is just like, if you like Resident Evil, regardless of which one you enjoyed, then you will like this. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't even know what RE5 is, so I don't think I can play that game. It sounds scary. No, it's it's not. Trust me. Uh, it's really not. Remember Napoleon and Resident Evil 4? Well, they took him and made him worse. Yeah, they made him really obnoxious. So you do know what Resident Evil 5 is. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you have fooled me, sir. Yes. I am the victor today. Now you have to play Resident Evil 5 with me so we can hate it together. True. Also, where, speaking of victor, victim, vickers, where is Brad Vickers in RE2? Why couldn't I shoot his stupid face off? Oh, yeah, he was just the zombie wandering around in, like, the little under section, right? Yeah, and you can't go there in this. No, you can, as in, in Leon. Oh, yeah, Leon's yeah, yeah. Campaign. It'd be, yeah. It'd be cool if he was just one of the random zombies that you run away for, from. I don't like But his it. dumb, I, I feel like I would have noticed his dumb yellow vest. Yeah, I don't think I saw him. Mm, that's disappointing. Um. Also, one last thing, they are releasing DLC for this, and it is free. Oh, what is it? Um, so we're getting Ghost Survivors, which is going to have Kendo, the gun shop owner, the mayor's daughter, and one of Hunk's people, and you're going to play through, like, little what-if stories from their perspectives. Oh, that's dope. I haven't even unlocked the fourth Survivor or any of those yet. Yeah, I think you will once you beat Leon. I don't think it depends on rank or anything, either. But, ugh, the guys, the game... It's so fucking good. Just get, just get it. Just go play it. It's fun. Spend seventy dollars for the deluxe version because it's you just got more stuff. Just do it. What is Sponsored in the collector's edition? Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you get more costumes. You get the original music. You can switch to and stuff like that. And I think you, uh, ooh, I want that. Yeah, you should get it. <laughs> Uh, you know, speaking of, I think I'm going to go play some Resident Evil 2, so that's going to be it for this episode of the podcast. Yeah. That was a good segue, don't you think? I'm going to kiss Mr. X on the forehead and take a big boy nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to try and dissect what that means. That's It's literally just what I said. So in terms of... Uh, uh, broken base type updates real fast. Um, I have a video planned for Crackdown 3 and um, uh, two planned for uh, Sekiro in March. I don't know when exactly those are going to happen, but the next big scripted review is going to be about uh, Sekiro and uh, the Soul series and all that fun stuff. I'm really excited for that video. And then again, I've got a uh, like a gameplay of first impressions on uh, Crackdown 3, and that's next week, uh, February 15th. So yeah, that'll be next week. Uh, and I'm looking forward to putting those videos together. And uh, uh, Will, if people want to see more of your stuff, where should they go? They could go to twitch.tv slash lumpkins, where I stream once every uh, few years. <laughs> But I am, okay, so for people who don't know, my uh, my actual computer computer died last year, but I am saving up for a new one, and I'm hoping to be back at it by June. So, that's what I'm shooting for. 
I, I wish you the best because I my computer is from 2012 and that shit's about to explode. Oh, so I'm no. going to be in the same boat very soon. And uh, well, at, at the very least, uh, people can go and see your Twitch streams and your YouTube videos. And he's got a lot of good stuff. Yeah. That's it. I don't feel like endorsing <laughs> you anymore. That's, uh, yeah. no, that's fine. I don't, you know, that's good. So, uh, hopefully, I have a brand new audio setup. This is actually the first video I'm doing from that audio setup. Hopefully, the content comes out more regularly. If uh, if schedules allow, there will be more episodes of the podcast, and it won't take two years to make this time. <laughs> hopefully not. I would like to do this again sometime. <laughs> I, I've jinxed it. So now the next episode of the podcast is scheduled for uh, June 2026. Well, yeah, because last time I think we did a podcast, you were like, yeah, we're going to try to do this more regularly. <laughs> yup. And uh, <laughs> that worked out. Hmm. So uh, at the very least, I can promise that there are more videos coming out uh, now that the 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 audio booth has been constructed and finalized, and hopefully those video projects include more podcasts. I do love talking a whole lot. Yeah, I just oh like yeah. hearing my own voice. Really so <laughs> that's just hurtful. I'm sorry. <laughs> so until next time, my name is Steve. Uh, what's your name, dipshit? Uh, well, and he's dead to me. This has been the Broken Base Podcast, and. I will see you next time. Bye.